Elder Fitu, we are waiting for whom? We cannot hear you, brother. You're, you're muted. Yet. You're muted. You can go for it now. And uh, Sue, you can start. Is the slides coming up, Fitu? Are the slides coming up? Okay. Technologies, right. technology. Go ahead, dear. <laughs> All right. Okay. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Great. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Whatever type of week you've had, I know I always look forward to the Sabbath where I can be still and listen to God's voice. Amen. My name is Sue and I'm a member here at East Auckland Church. And it's my honor to welcome you all to our East Auckland Church this morning. If this is your first time visiting us, thank you for joining us this Sabbath. May you richly be blessed. I'd like to say a wonderful good morning to our pastor, Sean Noel, and his beautiful wife, Chantal, and all the youth who are, all, who are away this weekend for okay. their revival Just... at Tui Ridge in Rotorua. It's wonderful to have you join us this morning, Pastor, and all the youth and everyone. This Sabbath, we are also privileged to have a guest speaker. On behalf of East Auckland, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Pastor Jim Howard, who will be sharing the word of God with us this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit blesses what he has to share with us this Sabbath. May God bless us as we fellowship together this morning. God bless. Good morning, church family. I have the privilege this morning of welcoming all our mothers who have joined us for our worship today. Happy Sabbath. Today we are thinking about the very special reason for coming together, especially when we know that we have the blessing of talking about our mothers. Mother's Day is set aside to express love, respect, honour and thanks to our mothers. So this morning on behalf of our church, Pastor jean -Well, elders and all the families, boys and girls of East Auckland, church we want to say a happy mother's day to all our mums this morning we want to acknowledge all you do in our church family and we thank and honor you all i just want to share a few bible quotes this morning to honor each of you here's one that we found proverbs 23 verse 25 may she who gave you birth be happy Another really wonderful promise, Proverbs 11, verse 16, a kind-hearted woman gains respect. And our last Bible verse, I want to dedicate as a challenge to all our mums this morning, and I'm sure our pastors, fathers, and children would agree that all of you definitely portray these beautiful characters. First Peter, verse 3 to 4. You should be known for the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. And may God richly bless each one of you as you continue to play the important role in your families, church, and community. Happy Sabbath, mothers, and happy Sabbath to all our church family those of, here, of us here in East Auckland listening in on Zoom and those of all our church family and all their youth and pastor and all the leaders that are in Tui Ridge, Rotorua, may God bless you today on your Sabbath. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm sorry, Rowan. Rowan. Um, could you please? Did I say it again? Oh. Um, you're not sharing sound, bro. You're not sharing okay. sound. Could you please share sound? Thanks. Is that working now? Uh, yep, yeah, that's better. Thank you. We just restart the video. Seeking the Lord's yes, and the entreaty, wander us on the mountain astray. Come unto me, this message repeat. Words of the master speaking today. Seeking the Lord's end, pointing to Jesus, so that our weekend, as that our soul, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going afar, going afar. As I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faith and praising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath once again. Uh, thank you, Sister Sue, for the warm welcome. Thank you, Elder Fitu, for the special uh, message to the mothers. Uh, I'll be going through the announcements. The first announcement is about the uh, youth camp that is ongoing in Tui Ridge Park. We thank God for the traveling messes and we thank God for the wonderful time that they are already having. 
uh, it's going uh, on from yesterday until tomorrow, the 8th of May. Uh, our next announcement regards the men's ministry, which uh, happens every Sabbath and Sunday morning at 6 a.m. And it, uh, we invite all men to join the program Men in Prayer. Uh, that is on Zoom, and the Zoom ID is uh, shown on the screen. Uh, the next announcement is on the care groups that are ongoing uh, throughout the week. I think we, uh, for more details on this one, you can contact the care group leaders. I, and uh, you can um, contact Sister Carlo or Sister Rosie for more details about this. And um, there's a discipleship series that is ongoing every Wednesday. Please feel free to join. Um, I think this is um, also done on Zoom and the Zoom ID is the same as the usual one that we use every week. Uh, then uh, this is a special announcement regarding the children's ministry. The, children, the children's ministry invites you all to join uh, the picnic day which is on the 22nd of May uh, from 10 a.m. And it is happening on um, Omana at Omana Regional Park. And there'll be games, there'll be singing, and there'll be food. Please bring a plate to share and something for the barbecue. Water, drinks, spare change, and feel free to invite friends as well. Thank you very much and have a blessed Sabbath. Amen. Thank you, Rotendo. For all those who are able to kneel, could you please do so? For others, it's fine just to remain seated. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. And we thank you for every day that you give us in our lives. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We get down on our knees and cry out to you that you forgive us for our sins, that you show us your truth and your way Amen. so that we may look forward to your return. Amen. Lord, we ask that you bless all those who are at the youth camp Amen. here at East Auckland or who are on Zoom or Facebook or any other means and are thus attending this service. Lord, we ask you to bless us all. We ask that you be with the, the youth camp, that they may have a, a joyous but humble meeting, that they may hear your word throughout the day. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the small company here today Amen. in East Auckland. Yes. People who have come along to listen to our guest speaker, Pastor Jim Howard from the US. Amen. Lord, we ask that you bless him, keep him safe from all harm and danger, Amen. and that you speak through him, Amen. and that we hear your words, not his. Amen. Lord, we Thank you for the blessings that you have given us in this last week. And we ask that you continue to bless us. We thank you for your forgiveness, your love, your mercy, yes. creation that you have made, and the promise of salvation, that we may be removed from this world of sin and evil. That purity will replace what is here. Lord, we ask that you Bless those throughout the world, those who are subject to war, famine, and disease, yes. that their lives may be improved, and that your word may come to them. Lord, there are still many more to reach out there, yes. and it is through evangelism by loyal servants such as our Pastor John Noel and others yes, that we are able to carry out the commission of Matthew, whereby we go to the whole world, all nations, tongues. For you promise us, Lord, that you will be with us to the end. 
It may not be an easy journey, Lord. There will be troubles ahead. But if we stay focused upon you, then we will be blessed with your presence in our lives in the end. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Church, again, good morning. We wish we were with you at East Auckland, but uh, the Lord has allowed us to be here, the young people, to, and we're having a good time. We need to let you know, church, we're having the best time since last night. The Spirit of God is moving upon the hearts of our young people, and they're excited for Jesus. We're, we're, we're a big number here. We're over 50-plus adults so um, nearly 60. So we praise the Lord. And, and then with the kids, we're over 80. So we're having the best time here. And we want you to know that we're missing you. We praise the Lord for you. Church, we are so blessed to have Pastor Jim Howard with us. If you don't know him, well, he's the one who's been blessing us with that book. Um, in fact, you see the cover uh, on, on the screen on your screen, that book, the, the, the Discipleship Handbook. Pastor Jim, we are so blessed, my brother. We've been blessed in studying this book, in praying. We, we've been, the Lord has been really showing us our need of him. Our mm. need not to remain as members, but to be disciples, to win mm. souls. So this is the author, church member. That's the author. He, Pastor Jim comes from the GC. He's responsible for the um, personal ministries and Sabbath school, if I'm correct, at the GC. And what a privilege to have you in your busy schedule. So God bless you, Pastor. We are very in depth to, to, the, to, to, to the moment you've given to us. I can tell you, Pastor, we are blessed. I'm blessed to have a wonderful church that is on fire for Jesus, exciting to do evangelism, and especially through the series you've, you've presented to us through this book. Uh, those two person who's been sitting next to each other, these are my two elders. They're like soulmates. They, 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 they love the Lord and they love the word of God. And I'm blessed to have them and the whole church. God bless you, my pastor. And may you speak to us. Take your time and may God be with you right now. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jean Noel, and thank you uh, for the invitation to Amen. join you. Um, I'll say a happy Sabbath to you and everyone. Even though it's not yet Sabbath here, I'm saying it by faith that in 25 minutes here in Maryland, it will be Sabbath. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, Amen. it's good to be be with you. Uh, this is my first time preaching in New Zealand, actually. So thank you for the invitation to East Auckland. It's, it's a, a privilege. <clears throat> I met one of your members, Anna, and uh, yes. I, would not, I would not do well to say her last name, so I'm not <laughs> going to try. But I met Anna because I was doing some teaching out at Weimar University in California, here in the U.S., and uh, there were about 15 students, and it was a it's a master's program there at Weimar, and I was uh, teaching a class on discipleship. I taught about 12 hours or so. It was just a short uh, time there, but but Anna, I met. She was not there. She was the one student that uh, was joining us by Zoom, and I think she was in New Zealand, uh, but she. Uh, contacted me later and we've had some interaction and and uh anyway uh i understand that your church has um has had the opportunity to explore a little bit in the discipleship handbook and that's a blessing whenever we hear that the lord is using that to any good it's always just a real encouragement to me and to our department at the general conference i'm the associate director at the uh sabbath school and personal ministries department and uh, there's what there is a director, Ramon Canals, that I work with closely. And then we have a staff of uh, about 10 or so. But anyway, um, 
we love talking about discipleship. It's something that I get a chance to focus on in my role. Um, and that was kind of what Pastor Jean Noel said, hey, let's talk about discipleship. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, it's not going to be a, a seminar uh, like I might do with the talk about the grow model or something like we work on in our department strategy for disciple making. It's going to be a sermon uh, because it's Sabbath morning. And I'm going to challenge you a little bit today. I'm going to talk about discipleship, uh, something that's at the heart of discipleship. The title of the message is called to preach, called to preach. And uh, I know that we've had prayer, but I'm going to ask you just give me one moment to ask God's blessing as I open the word with you today. Yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of being able to share with my brothers and sisters in New Zealand. And uh, Lord, what a blessing. The technology can be a challenge, but it's also a blessing that I can meet with my brothers and sisters in this way. But we pray, Lord, that the word of God would speak to each one of our hearts just now. We pray for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom to understand and to be transformative in our hearts and in our lives. So bless us to this end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> called to preach. You may think from that title that uh, I'm going to share my testimony, but uh, maybe I'll share a little piece or two here or there, an experience, but, but that's not what this sermon is about. This sermon is not about me being called to preach. It's about you being called to preach. Actually, it's about all of us being called to to preach. And uh, that is something that, uh, that we don't talk a lot about when we talk about discipleship, but it is at the heart, the very core of discipleship is this call. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, to start, to kind of shape the message, I want to remind us that when we talk about discipleship, um, and the, the mission that has been entrusted to us as Seventh-day Adventists to make disciples, we're not merely talking about making generic disciples, but we are called to make end-time disciples, disciples who are preparing for the coming of Jesus. And as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we believe that, uh, that we uh, are a fulfillment of Revelation 12, 17, and what the Bible refers to as the remnant church. And uh, the idea of a remnant, um, that, that terminology, we don't use a lot very often anymore anyway, but a remnant, perhaps when we do use it, it might be when we're speaking about a remnant of carpet or a remnant of cloth, and it's talking about the last piece of an original bolt. Okay, so it's the last piece of the original. That's the remnant. It's the, remain, the remaining piece of something that was original. And as uh, Seventh-day Adventists, we believe the concept of remnant refers back to the apostolic church, to the church in the time of Jesus. So the idea of the remnant is that it will have similar characteristics, similar traits to the church that was established by Jesus and the apostles. So how, in what way is the remnant like that church? Well, if you think about it, uh, Jesus and the apostles kept all of God's commandments, including the Bible Sabbath. And so that's one of the significant uh, aspects that the Seventh-day Adventist church holds to. Um, just as the early church was blessed by the spirit of prophecy and had the prophetic gift among it, so is the Seventh Avenue Church blessed with the prophetic gift. Uh, just as they held fast to the faith of Jesus, so do we aim to hold fast to the faith of Jesus. Just as they experienced persecution, so shall we, if we aren't already, uh, experience persecution. But there's a vital characteristic of the early church that we are to share, that we don't often talk about, and that is the call to preach, the call to preach. 
This was very strong in the apostolic original church, and we believe that it is a key trait of the remnant church. So how are we going to understand this? Let's pause for just a moment on the idea of, of our day, and let's look back at the original church and see how uh, this call to preach, where, where we see it. So let's look at the book of Acts together, and I hope you have your Bibles. If you do, um, you can follow along with me. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 8, and here in Acts, um, we're right after Acts chapter 7, where we have the stoning of Stephen, and you may know, you may remember the story. Uh, Stephen was a, a great uh, deacon. He was one of the seven. We refer to him as a deacon, um, and he was the first Christian martyr here in the book of Acts, and there was a, a, a leader of the persecution who was standing by, and that was uh, Saul, or the great apostle Paul prior to his conversion. And, you know, he was deeply convicted. I mean, Stephen was very spiritual. He looks to heaven and asks God to not charge the sin of, of this incredible uh, death he was experiencing, the persecution he was experiencing. Don't charge this against them. I mean, he was totally forgiving. The Spirit of God was upon him. And when Saul saw this, he was under deep conviction. And you know, when you're under deep conviction, there's two directions you can go. You can either yield to that conviction and, and repent and, and confess and surrender, or you can try to push back against the conviction and fight it even more strongly. And that's what the apostle, before being the apostle, that's what Saul, the persecutor, began to do. And he ramped up the persecution that was happening. And you read about it in Acts chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, now Saul was consenting to his death. That's Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So here's this great persecution now against the believers, those who believed in Jesus. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So take note of what's happening here. This great persecution is happening, and everybody is fleeing. The believers are being chased down. The believers are, are being uh, uh, punished and persecuted, and so they're having to flee, and they take off to Judea and Samaria, except one group of people, and that group of people was the apostles. The apostles stayed back in Jerusalem. Now, we would, we would refer to the apostles today maybe as the pastors and administrators, okay? The apostles, the leaders, the, the ones who we refer to as called to preach, they were stuck in Jerusalem, and all the lay people, the church members, were scattered, okay? Are you tracking? All right, now let's look at what happens in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8. It says, therefore, those who were scattered, not the apostles, they were back in Jerusalem, those who were scattered, the lay people, the church members, went everywhere preaching the word. Now, this is the heart of the growth of the early church, was not primarily, though it was greatly contributed to by the apostle Paul, by the apostles, we see that really the growth of the early church happened because the lay people went everywhere preaching the word. We could trace this further in the book of Acts, and you'd find in Acts chapter 11, for instance, that they formed a, a church there in Antioch uh, that was raised up by the preaching of these lay people. And they had to send Barnabas over. The apostles sent Barnabas over to check it out. And Barnabas saw it and said, hey, keep doing what you're doing. And it was in Antioch there in chapter 11 where it says that they were first called Christians because everywhere they went, they were preaching Christ. And this was the lay people that we're talking about here. It's the church members. This was the model of church in the original church was the lay people going everywhere preaching the word. Now, I think it is important that we recognize here that we're not talking about 
these lay people carrying around pulpits or raising up tents, okay? This is not what they were doing. To preach in the Bible is, it simply means to proclaim the good news, to share the good news of the Word of God, okay? So this is not talking about, about preaching in the sense of a pastor standing at the pulpit. This is just talking about sharing the Word, sharing the good news. And since they were doing it while they were scattered, think about it, if they were being scattered and they were preaching the word as they were scattered, you get the sense that a lot of it was personal, right? Not just, they weren't uh, in some big public setting, but it says those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So they were preaching to small groups of people, to individuals. There was a lot of personal proclamation going on rather than just public proclamation. Those early believers, we might call them, if you, if, if you give me this license to say this, we might call them personal preachers, personal preachers. I like that. I like the idea of a church of personal preachers. Now, the Desire of Ages, one of uh, the most fantastic books you can read, most transformative books you can read in your life. It, it, it was one of the first books I read after my own conversion, and it, and it really made a deep impact on my life. And in that book, toward the end, on page 822, it includes us today with those who first began to spread the gospel, these personal preachers in the book of Acts. Listen to this statement from Desire of Ages, page 822. It says, the Savior's commission to the disciples, okay, to the to the 12, included all the believers. It includes all believers to the end of time, all believers in Christ to the end of time. So that's a pretty powerful statement. Ellen White is saying that the commission given to the disciples stretches all the way to our day, and it includes our day. So to one degree or another, in one form or another, God is calling on every one of us to preach. And believe it or not, this is at the heart of discipleship. This is at the heart of discipleship, this call to preach. Not talking about, again, standing at a pulpit. Man. I'm talking about sharing the truth in some way of God's Word, the truth of God's Word that has changed our lives, sharing it in some way with others. That burden rests on every disciple of Christ. Now, a lot of times when we talk about the mission, we immediately say that the mission of the church and the mission of everybody in the church is to make disciples, and that's exactly correct. But we need to remember that Matthew 28 and the Great Commission is not the only mission command in the Gospels. There are several mission commands in the Gospels, and we need to read all of them. As Seventh-day Adventists, the way that we interpret the Bible is that we take not just one text or one passage, but everything that the Bible says on a particular topic, and we compare Scripture with Scripture so we have a full context and we can get all the perspectives and get a full picture of what God is trying to tell us, and, and a true interpretation or understanding of what the Bible is trying to tell us. So remember, Matthew 28 does say that we are to go and make disciples. So we can say, okay, that's our commission, to go and make disciples. And that is true. But I count six other passages that describe the church's mission to the whole world. Okay? Now, certainly, the Great Commission is to the whole world. Uh, you will read that later in Matthew 28. It talks about that going to all the earth. But it's not the only place where Jesus refers to a mission that goes to the whole world. There are uh, six others that I'd like to look at with you so that you can get a better picture of really the heart of what the mission is and to, to go and make disciples. So the first one that I'll just reference, okay, I won't turn there, is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, okay? This is... Um, at the time of the ascension of Jesus, and he tells the disciples that they are to wait for the promise of the Father, to wait for the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon them, 
they shall be witnesses. It says, you shall be witnesses to me to the end of the earth, you know, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. So here we recognize that one of the seven mission commands refers to witnessing to the end of the earth. But five of the seven, okay, one is the great commission to go and make disciples. We'll look at that last. One is this call to witness to the earth. And then five of them, five of the seven, do you know what the heart of them is? Do you know what the five of the seven mission commands that were given to the church, the heart of them is? It's to preach. Five of the seven. Now, I'm going to share them with you. Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, preach the gospel to the whole world, and then the end will come. Mark 13, verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. That's two. Number three, Mark 16, verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's three. Luke 24, verse 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. That's four. That time it doesn't refer to the gospel, but it gives a little detail and says repentance and remission of sins should be preached to all nations. But in, in any effect, it's the same thing. It's preaching the gospel, and it re references preaching. And the fifth of the, uh, the, the uh, ones that refer to preaching specifically is one you should know very well. It's actually not in the gospels. It's in the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, let me just pause for a second and speak about the significance of Revelation 14, because in Matthew 24, the first one that we read, it said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. There's two primary things happening in these texts, and I'm going to speak first of Matthew 24, 14. Preaching the gospel to all the world, and then the second thing, the end will come, okay? Those are the two basic building blocks of this prophecy, and I call it a prophecy because that's exactly what it is. The gospel will be preached to all the world, and then the end will come. He's telling us that's what's going to happen. This is going to happen in the future. This was Jesus' prophecy. Well, you know Seventh-day Adventists, that prophecy has this principle of pan and zoom, we call it sometimes, where prophecy will go over a, 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 a span of time, and then you might have another prophecy that covers the same span of time, but it zooms in and gives you a little more detail, okay? Well, that's what, for instance, let me give you a for instance, Daniel chapter two. You know Daniel chapter two, right? There's this great image that Daniel sees, and it's got a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet and, and uh, toes of, of uh, iron and clay. And this great image rep is representing four kingdoms and then a divided kingdom. And it starts in Babylon and extends all the way to the coming of Jesus, the great stone cut out of a mountain without hands. So this prophecy in Daniel 2 covers that whole scope. But then we come to Daniel 7, and it covers the same ground. It again has Babylon, this time represented. Sorry, could you say that again? Oops, my I watch is talking to me. I <laughs> Sorry, Siri was talking to me. Uh, in Daniel 7, you have Babylon represented by this lion, right? And then uh, you have a bear that represents Medo-Persia, and, and then you have a leopard with four heads that represents Greece. And then you have a dreadful beast that represents Rome. It covers the exact same ground as Daniel 2, except when you get to the end and that dreadful beast, just like the, the image had 10 toes, 
the dreadful beast has 10 horns, but in on the dreadful beast, we learn that three of the horns are plucked out and then a little horn comes up and he speaks pompous words and he persecutes the saints. And there's this judgment scene. All of this is new detail in Daniel 7. So Daniel 2 covers the whole scope. Daniel 7 covers the same scope, but then zooms in, okay? This is the idea of prophecy in the Bible. It's pan and zoom, okay? Well, the same thing happens in these prophecies of the gospel. In Matthew 24, that's the Daniel 2, uh, that's the Daniel 2 prophecy, right? The gospel will preach to all the world, and then the end will come. But in Revelation 14, it refers to the gospel pre being preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, gospel going to the whole world. And then in verse 14 of Revelation 14, it talks about one like the Son of Man coming with a sharp sickle in his hand to reap the harvest of the earth. That's talking about the end coming. That's the second coming. But in between Revelation 14, 6 and Revelation 14, 14, are the three angels' messages, which basically are taking the, the, the generic or, or simple statement, the gospel will be preached from Matthew 24, and zooming in and telling us what is included in that gospel that must be preached to the whole world. And wouldn't you know it, it includes the three angels' messages, to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. In other words, it's got to be a call to Understand that the judgment has arrived, an understanding of 1844 and the, and the investigative judgment. It calls on uh, everyone to worship the creator in the way that the worship has asked to be created. It's a message of the Sabbath has to be included in the gospel that goes to the whole world before the end will come. And then you have this call to, to, to come out of Babylon, that Babylon has fallen. And then you have this warning against receiving the mark of the beast which is this final test that will happen at the end of time between tradition and the word of God. And all of this is part of the gospel that has to be preached before the end will come. The end will not come from a generic gospel being preached to the world. The end will only come when the three angels are preached to the world. Matthew 24, 14 includes the three angels, like Daniel 2 includes the investigative judgment. It's not explicitly mentioned, but it's zoomed in when you go to Revelation 14 and you see it in more detail. So we're not talking about just making disciples here. We're talking about making end time disciples who are ready for the coming of Jesus. That is what the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been called to do. So we have these seven mission commands that I've mentioned. We have the one that calls on us to be witnesses to all the world. Then we have five that we just looked at that call on us to preach the gospel to all the world. Now listen to this statement from Acts of the Apostles, page 32. Acts of the Apostles, page 32. Um, this is a, a description of Jesus' discipleship training. When he sent forth the twelve, and afterward the seventy, to proclaim the kingdom of God, he was teaching them their duty to impart to others what he had made known to them. He was teaching them their what? Their duty to impart to others what he had made known to them. In all his work, he was training them for individual labor to be extended as their numbers increased, and eventually to reach to the uttermost parts of the earth. You see what Jesus was doing? In making disciples, he was training them to share what he had told them, and as their numbers increased, and they individually, he focused on individual labor. He's not talking about, he's not telling you you have to preach to congregations and to large crowds, but he is calling on every disciple to share in their own sphere. And that preaching or sharing of the word is multiplied and it reaches to the uttermost parts of the earth. That was the discipleship plan that Jesus had. The disciples were to impart to others through individual labor, and then that would extend to the rest of the world. Now, interestingly, the Apostle Paul hits on this exact point, and I want to read just a couple of texts to you 
Um, this first text I want to share with you from the Apostle Paul is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. There's probably not a better verse in the Bible on discipleship than 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, okay? So I'm, that's my little plug for this verse. The Apostle Paul says this, and he's writing to Timothy, okay, a young minister. He says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, Paul is saying, I taught you, Timothy, that's two. Timothy, you commit these to faithful men, that's three. And then they will be able to teach others also. That's four generations of disciples in one scripture. Okay, the Apostle Paul had this principle that Jesus had instilled in the early church, and he was trying to pass it along. This idea that we are to pass from generation to generation, multiplying disciples, and we can't do that unless we obey one specific aspect of the call of discipleship, and that is the call to preach, the call to share the truth that has gripped our own souls. This is central to being a disciple. It's central to being a disciple. It's interesting how he finishes it. He says in that verse, who will be able to teach others also. The apostle Paul believed that part of the process of disciple making was teaching others. This is something that everyone is called to do. Let me show you another place. Okay, we just recently in Sabbath school, we studied Hebrews, right? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 12, Hebrews 5, verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, for though by this time you ought to be what? Teachers. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses uh, exercised to discern both good and evil. So by reason of use, that's reading the word, understanding the word, and sharing the word. By doing that, you have your senses exercised to discern between good and evil. But if you're not doing that, then you still need milk. You're, you ought to be teachers, he said, but you still need this milk. So, you see, the Apostle Paul is saying that in one way, I'm not talking about public. I'm not talking about, you know, even the gift of teaching. I'm not talking about that. But in a way, we are all called to share with others what we know. That's a, a, a form of teaching, okay? And that's the kind of teaching the apostle is saying that, that everyone should kind of, from one generation, continue to pass along. Now, let me put some caveats in here, lest I be misunderstood, okay? We need to nurture and care for our own members through various programs, and we need to minister to our community's physical needs, their, their emotional needs. These are no question vital parts of our mission. Um, I will refer to these often as preparing the soil. It's essential to the disciple-making process. But the point of this sermon, the point that I'm trying to emphasize today with you, is that we can't afford for our members to gravitate only to soil preparation ministries. While comparably few are involved in the core command to preach, the command that is central to everything that is ever said about the mission by Jesus. I mean, if you really look at it, it is central. It is central to what it means to be a disciple. We are to share the truth of God's word through personal invitations, through conversations, through literature, through media, through Bible studies. There is a power in the truth of God's word. This is why the apostle Peter said that we are born again through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. We're born again through the word. Let me just give you a, a 
my own personal conviction on this comes from the fact that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. And okay, I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born into a Seventh-day Adventist home. And my parents left the church when I was nine years old. Okay. There was a, a divorce situation. There was some uh, false doctrine that got my dad off track and, and everything else. And he just kind of gave up on it. And we didn't go to church at all in my formative years. So after I was nine, the only thing I remembered from those early days was being in Sabbath school, maybe Vespers singing around the campfire. I mean, they're just very vague memories I had. So growing up in, in my uh, you know, from the time I was nine years old to the time I was 22 years old, I was in a secular home, basically. And I was in a very secular home. <laughs> I mean, I, in high school, what have you, I mean, I had friends and we just uh, lived a very, um, a big party type of lifestyle. That was how I lived. When I was 22, I, I moved from one state to another here in the United States. And changed schools, uh, went to a different university, and I kind of separated from some of my friends that, that uh, I was close to, and I had more time to think, and I had some curiosity, just a little bit of curiosity. Um, I had always said, even while I was during those, those middle years when I was living in a secular home, when I was hanging around my friends, I was claiming to be a Christian, uh, but I didn't know a single verse in the Bible. Like, I couldn't have told you a single thing, so I was always a little worried that they might challenge me on it. I, if there's one thing I hated more than anything, it was being caught embarrassed, you know, or something. So I always had it in my mind at some point, you know, since I say that I'm a Christian, I ought to read a little bit of the Bible to see what it says in there. Like I had no clue, none. So at the age of 22, in the basement of my parents' home, going to university, I decided that I would just read a little bit of the Bible just so that I didn't embarrass myself if somebody ever said anything to me. And in three weeks, I was converted. I read and the Lord Jesus spoke to me so powerfully. I saw eternal realities and I had no clue they were in there. Man, I remember man. going up and speaking to my father and saying, dad, if this is all true, what are we all doing here? Nobody's talking about this. Everybody's just going on like, like, like eternity's not at stake. I mean, is this true? And I was convicted deeply. And you know what? I had no, I went to no evangelistic meetings. No one gave me a Bible study. And I believe in evangelistic meetings and Bible studies, believe me. Wow. But I was convicted solely on the power of the Bible, just reading the Bible. The Spirit of God got a hold of me. It was the right time in my life. And the Lord Jesus spoke to my heart. So, yeah. brothers and sisters, when I tell you that the, that the core of discipleship is sharing the word, it's because I know that the real power to convert souls is not yes. in your loving kindness, as no, no, wonderful no, no. as that may be. Yes. But the real power to convert souls is in the message itself of the Bible. Amen. The Lord Jesus reveals himself through the Bible to people yes. and converts their hearts. And that is the only thing that will convert their hearts. Praise so we need brothers and sisters, to not let go of this call to preach. It is central to discipleship. Amen. Uh, Ellen White, let me just give you, I mean, reinforce this a little bit with a couple of statements by Ellen White. The book Christian Service, I would highly recommend to you. And Christian Service, page 68, says this. The dissemination of the truth of God, dissemination means the spreading of the truth of God, is not confined to a few ordained ministers. The truth is to be scattered by all who claim to be disciples of Christ. Man. Okay? All are to scatter the truth. Man. Okay? Here's another one. This one, it gets, this one goes from preaching to meddling, okay? This is Christian Service, page 37. It says, Satan is now seeking to hold God's people in a state of inactivity to keep them from acting their part in spreading the truth. Now that itself is powerful, okay? The devil's trying to keep God's people inactive and to keep them from acting their part, the part that they're responsible for. And what is that? Spreading the truth. And then she says this, that they may at last be weighed in the balance and found wanting. You see, if we're not sharing the truth, 
we stop growing spiritually. If we only feed ourselves and never have a, 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 a way, a, an avenue of expressing our faith or of, um, of sharing our burden for souls, then we don't continue to grow. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy agree that we are called to share the truth with others. We're called to preach. Five of the seven global mission texts explicitly call on us to preach. Acts 1 verse 8 simply uses a different word when it says it calls on us to be witnesses, but it's conveying the same idea, which, by the way, confirms that just like preaching, witnessing is not a spiritual gift. And let me just say, this is one of the biggest things that is killing the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is a wrong understanding of spiritual gifts. Yes, spiritual gifts are different. Yes, our personalities are different. You might be introverted, somebody else might be extroverted. All that is true, and that will alter and change the way that we express our faith or share the truth with others. But... Witnessing is not something that only a certain class of disciples do. It is, I, I like to say, you know, when you go to buy a car, you might have to pay extra for alloy wheels or a sunroof or, or you know, uh, leather seats or seat warmers or whatever. But you don't have to pay extra for a steering wheel. You don't have to pay extra for tires. Okay, that's standard equipment. And brothers and sisters, witnessing for the Christian is not something for certain special Christians. It's standard equipment. It's something that everyone who receives the Holy Spirit becomes a witness. I would go so far as to say it's not just that it's not a spiritual gift. Witnessing is a spiritual necessity for every believer. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing are the three essential components to grow in the Christian life. Now, there's one more verse that we haven't looked at, and I'd like, I'd like to wrap up in this verse. It's Matthew 28 itself, okay? So, you know, we like it when, when, the, when the call to the mission is just to make disciples, because that seems a lot easier than all the other ones that say that we're to preach. <laughs> Make disciples sounds a little bit, you know, oh, well, I can do that in different ways, but preach, that just seems so narrow. But I am going to suggest to you that make disciples is preaching and more. Make disciples is not something different from preaching. Make disciples is preaching plus. And let me just pause by explaining, okay? Let's, let's look together at Matthew 28. This is a, an important, a very important passage of Scripture. Matthew 28, and we'll look at verse uh, 18. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, by the way, some versions, uh, the King James will say all power. Um, the authority here is inclusive of power. Okay, so it is authority is probably the better word, but it includes power. It, and the way you know this is go to look all the places in, in the New Testament where it speaks about Jesus having authority. He has authority over the wind and the waves. What does that mean? That means that they obey him. They, he has power over them. He has authority over unclean spirits. What does that mean? It means they obey him. He has power over them. In every case, when it says Jesus has authority, it includes the power to do what he wants with that thing. So when he says, all authority has been given me, it means he has all power, okay? And that is why we can go make disciples. If we didn't have that, if the Holy Spirit had not come upon us, we could never be witnesses. If the power was not, it did not belong to Jesus, we could just give up now because we can't convert a single soul. But Jesus says, all authority has been given me, therefore go. That's what he says in verse 19. So let's look at it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We could spend a lot of time on these verses of Scripture. I'm not going to do that with you, but I want to focus on 
the verb that's translated make disciples. Because you might notice in the King James, that is translated teach all nations. Go and teach all nations. But here it's go and make disciples. I'm reading from the King, the New King James, and most modern translations also translated, I believe, correctly to make disciples. That's translated from the Greek mathetuo, mathetuo. And that stems from the manthano, basically, which is to learn, and mathete, which is a disciple. And a disciple is is speaking about not just a learner, but someone who has a mentor or a teacher or a master, okay? So the idea of, of this passage is not just teaching, as in teach all nations. We're not merely to teach, but it's we're to make a mathete. So it's to actually persuade others to accept the teaching and to follow it. You see, you can preach and teach and not concern yourself with how it's received. That's possible. But that's not making disciples. That's not the commission. Making disciples means winning converts, not just sharing information. And this is why the mission re actually requires more than preaching. It requires a consistent life so that our words have influence. It requires compassion and tact and coming close to people so that we can not only win their minds, but win their hearts. Making disciples requires not just preaching, but coming close to people. It requires personal preaching. It requires a, 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 a loving and careful and compassionate approach to persuading someone to receive the gospel. Listen to this from Christ's Object Lessons, page 57. In the ministry of the word, there is too much sermonizing and too little of real heart-to-heart -heart work. Sermonizing is just sharing information. Heart-to-heart -heart work is seeking to win someone to the truth that you're sharing. She says, there is a need of personal labor for the souls of the lost. And then she says this, while logic may fail to move and argument be powerless to convince the love of Christ revealed in personal ministry, may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root. You see, every public evangelist worth their salt knows that the secret to successful public evangelism is personal evangelism. Phone calls and visits, prayers and words of encouragement, home invitations, social gatherings, sympathy, sympathy, personal labor before, during, and after the meetings, all this is the secret of success. Now, let me share one more quote on this point. This one's from Christian Service, page 69. Let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, they must carry the burden that the Lord has laid upon them, the burden of leading souls into the truth. You see, as we said earlier, this is not just something we're doing to reach the world, but in order to grow in spirituality, we have to participate in this. This is God's way of at the same time reach, that he reaches the world, at the same time preparing his own people for the coming of Jesus. And each person who is reached then turns around and reaches others, and that helps them to grow and prepares them for the coming of Jesus. Remember, brothers and sisters, you don't need a special gift to carry that burden. The Lord has laid that burden on everyone who has received salvation. To pray for your neighbors and your friends, to invite them to Sabbath school, start there. Uh, share literature or audio sermons with them. That's a way to share the truth. Or dare I say, give them a Bible study. And you may feel, oh, I could never do that. Let me tell you something. The the method of Bible study that we use in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where we take Bible study guides with a question and then a Bible answer. Anyone can do that who can read the scriptures and who can tell what their own experience is. If you can do that, you don't need the spiritual gift of teaching to take someone through a Bible study to go through that together with them. We need far more members who are willing to do this. This is a problem in the church. I'm telling you that if you want to see room for potential in the church, it's 
people willing to simply go through the Bible with people. This is what God is calling on the remnant church to pick up. Remember, the early church went everywhere preaching the word. Let me just tell you a little history, a little, little, little story, and then I'm going to close. Elder Stephen Haskell was one of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he went and preached at a camp meeting in Southern California in the 1880s. And he was at this camp meeting preaching, and there was a big rainstorm. And it was so loud on the tent, and they didn't have amplification, but there was wind and thunder and the rain hitting the, the tent. And so it was so loud that they were talking about closing the meeting. It just wasn't, it was fruitless. But Elder Haskell was inspired with an idea. He walked down to the middle of the tent, called everybody to gather around him, and he began to, he continued his sermon in the form of a Bible study. He started saying, um, who gave the scriptures? And they said, brother over here, uh, can you read for us 2 Timothy uh, 3.16? And then he would read, all scripture was given by inspiration of God. And then he would say, oh, thank you for that. And then he would, sister over here, and he would give another question in a Bible text, and she would read it. And it kept the attention of the people, the entire message. And there was somebody there by the name of W.C. White, affectionately known as Willie White, the son of Ellen White, and he was so moved by it that he went and told his mother, who was on the campground, but not at that particular meeting, and she said, I want to talk to Elder Haskell and the pastors, and she called them together, and she said, listen, God has shown me in vision that at the end of time, there would be a mighty reformation in which God's people would be going into people's homes and sharing the truth in the same way as Elder Haskell did in that sermon. Question, Bible answer. Question, Bible answer. Elder Haskell was so excited about it, he started a training program called a Bible Reading Institute. Ever hear of a book called Bible Readings for the Home? This started from that stormy service where they started sending in, he, they started inviting church members to send in question and Bible answer, Bible readings, they called them. It's simply what you and I call a Bible study. And then he invited everyone who could. He said, even if your head is sprinkled with gray, he put an ad in the signs of the times, even if your head is sprinkled with gray, you're none too old to read the scriptures and do it, to tell what God has done for you. So the excitement they had about giving these Bible studies and sharing the truth in this way was that you didn't need to be a pastor. It wasn't dependent upon the pastors anymore to share the message. Now, any layperson could use this simple method to share the truth and to multiply disciples. In fact, you can read about in Testimonies Volume 9, where she says, hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. This is the vision she saw. That's in Testimonies Volume 9, page 126, if you want to check it out for yourself. So as I draw this message to a close, I just want you to consider this question. When Ellen White received a vision of the future in which there was a mighty reformation, you know, and we've been praying for revival and reformation in the church, but she saw a mighty reformation, and she saw hundreds and thousands of Seventh-day Adventists sharing Bible truth with others. When she saw that vision, did she see you? Did she see you? Were you one of those people who was sharing faith with your faith with others? Maybe it was just on social media sharing an audio sermon. Maybe it was a, a glow tract or a piece of literature. Maybe you were giving a Bible study. Maybe you were just sharing your testimony. Maybe you were inviting people to a church service. However it is that you're carrying that burden to lead people into the truth, did she see you doing that? I believe that God has called every one of us to preach. And I'm not talking about publicly, but I am talking about in personal ways, to become more active in sharing truth-filled literature and media and our testimony, perhaps inviting friends or church visitors to go through that series of Bible studies with you. Are you willing to become a personal preacher? The core of the mission of making disciples, motivated by a burden for souls that you carry on your heart and in your prayers.
I believe this is what Jesus was training his disciples for, and I believe it's what he is training us for. May God empower you, may he bless you, and may he give you fruit from your labors is my prayer for you today. God bless you. Pastor James, the church, we want to thank God for you. Um, I was receiving some messages from my two elders. They, they, they're both crazy in the right sense for Christ. Amen. <laughs> for the three angels message. And they were telling me, wow, did Pastor, are you hearing what, what we're hearing? This man is preaching about the three angels message and our need to, because we've been impressed lately that this is why we exist. Amen. And so I told them it's not Pastor Jim preaching, it's God speaking to us. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank God for allowing, for, for, for you, for allowing him to speak to you. Mm -hmm. That was certainly not you. That, that, that's the message that we need to hear in these last days. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for making time for us. Mm -hmm. We are excited that you've been speaking on Zoom to us, but we're dreaming that you would come a life to us in New Zealand, right? If that is God's will. Amen. And we'll pray about that. The church is preparing for some wonderful um, campaigns. It's going to be the our members preaching. We're hoping five, six, seven campaigns around our church just Amen. to place. And wow, thank you for giving us that bigger insight of what discipleship is all about. It's mm. not only one generation, but one, two, three, four. Amen. So thank you. God bless you. We would love you to pray with us and pray for us as we close. Um, and God bless your ministry too at the GC. Thank yes. you so much. So much. All right, let me, let me pray with you. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Mm. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the privileges that are ours. Um, first and foremost, we're thankful for Jesus. Yes for the salvation that he so freely gave. It cost him everything, but it was free to us. And yet, Lord, uh, there is a cost to discipleship. Yes. And we recognize that. Right. And we can't do it without you. So we come to you humbly, praying for your tender mercies. Amen. Uh, many of us, Lord, we recognize that we perhaps are not all that our potential would have us to be. And so we pray for your help, Lord. We pray for the spirit. We pray for your grace. We pray that you would transform us day by day, that you would be patient with us, Lord, but that you would do a powerful work in us and change us, transform us into your image. And part of that image that we saw as we read through the gospels in the life of Jesus is just this burden for souls and this wonderful uh, message that, uh, that touches hearts and that grips them. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that this message would grip our hearts again. Amen. First and foremost, help us to fall in love with the truth of the three angels' messages all over again. Oh. Uh, we will only share what we ourselves are powerfully uh, persuaded by. And so please, Lord, help us first and foremost to, um, to fall in love with the message of the Bible and with the, the, the end time message you've entrusted us with. And then, Lord, I pray for your power and strength to be given in a special way to those in East Auckland in this beautiful church that is uh, seeking to be active disciple makers. Lord, empower them. There's young people that are listening here. There are many members who yes, perhaps yes. Uh, have not uh, done all that their potential would allow them to do, but they need uh, motivation. They need courage. Um, they need to hear your voice, Lord, and to hear your call clearly. And I pray that you would do that for them Amen. and that you would, in a mighty way, Pour out the spirit of God on this church. Yes, and thank you for Pastor Jean Noel. And I pray that you would bless him and his leadership. And uh, Lord, ultimately, um, 
We just want to be in harmony with your will. So save us, Lord, in spite of ourselves, and then use us to save others. Amen. And just thank you for hearing us. We thank you for, uh, for now abiding with us Amen. as we continue the Sabbath. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, again. And church, thank you.